welcome everybody. This is our first of five, and that's a question mark to Steve. Five, right? Yep. Five events that should have been in person, which kind of makes me sad that we're not in person, but we're going to make the most of it. So I, w I still want this to be somehow as interactive as we can make it. Um, so with that, Steve is going to be monitor monitoring the chat thread in this meeting, and so Steve's going to politely interrupt us or stop us if there's a conversation that we want to have or take a break. Um, I will ask everybody just kind of stay on mute and use chat to get a hold of us if we if we need to. Um, oh, raise your I, hands. Oh yeah, oh yeah, look at that using the features of the software, huh? Yeah. Um, we recently discovered that and love it very <laughs> much. So um, raise your hand and Steve will make sure to call that out as we go along. Um, so let's get started. I suppose I need to highlight the presentation we had next. There we go. So we're going to discuss today cybersecurity and zero trust, and I'll explain why we're discussing those two things. But we're going to go through a round of brief round of introductions. We'll talk about the state of cybersecurity, and I'll get to why we're going there in a few minutes. We will define cybersecurity and zero trust. We're going to look at building a zero trust model with Microsoft tools. And then we're going to demo, which is the, the fun part of it, demo the zero trust Microsoft infrastructure in action. And Mike will be taking over the demo. We'll leave time at the end for questions if you have any. But again, I, I want to try to make this as interactive as possible. So if you do have questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat. And Steve will be kind enough to respond as we go. Introductions. So my name is Jason Rutherford. I am the co-founder and managing partner of Model Technology Solutions. We have Mike Brimberry, the director of cybersecurity at Model Technology Solutions, and Dan Ramakadi, who's with Microsoft, and he's a senior technical specialist with Cloud Endpoint. Dan, make sure I got that right. That is perfect. Thank you, Jason. Excellent. All right. Uh, so who we are. So we are starting, Model is starting their 10th year in business. We focus primarily on cybersecurity, Microsoft M365, and we have a lot of data center expertise. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Brimberry is a, has multiple designations, but uh, CISSP with 20 plus years of experience from the security background. Uh, we are both virtual CISOs for multiple organizations in various industries. Uh, we're both cybersecurity speakers and panelists, and we have multiple cybersecurity industry certifications including some of the following. So a little more about model. So I always like to bring up our core values because it's important as we look at who we're partnering with and doing business with that. So from a model perspective, we lead with integrity. So we're always doing what's right for the customer. And sometimes it's not in models favor, uh, but it is always right for the customer and the solution along the way. We serve with compassion. Our aim is to help you improve and everybody at model, their goal is simply to help. We say be revolutionary here, and it's really, we love to innovate or find ways, uh, whether it's things like bringing you information like this and being a little dynamic on the fly, switching to a Teams meeting versus in person, or in our technical solutions when we actually deliver. And then my favorite, live life like a mullet. Uh, we're professional, but we have the right balance of fun. We're all very approachable. So just to recap our services, uh, Microsoft 365, cybersecurity services, cloud and data center infrastructure, and we also do outsourcing help desk for customers. So enough about us, let's talk about cybersecurity. So we put in some cybercrime numbers, and this is not meant uh, to be a scare tactic. It's really meant to um show uh what we're up against in the cybersecurity realm okay so keep some of these in mind as we talk about the zero trust infrastructure it'll help kind of paint why zero trust is important so attacks occur every 11 seconds and this is based on 2022 data just so you know the average time where's my next button the average time to detect a breach is 287 days Ransomware by itself will exceed $20 billion by the end of 2022. And then ransomware attacks are expected to rise to $265 billion 
in the next nine years. So think about that growth and what that means for from a cybersecurity or a security perspective for our networks and data that we care about. Further, the global cost of cybercrime in 2022 was estimated at $8 trillion and in the next five years is expected to surge to $23 trillion. It is a uh, it is a battle that we are up against. And so with that, we're, help, we're trying to help bring information on what some of these um, tactics are to help thwart that. We're going to define cybersecurity and zero trust. So first, what is cybersecurity? Sorry for the eye chart, but it is at first and foremost a business function that is accompanied by technology to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover critical business data. So that is a key thing to understand. A cybersecurity program would include things like business processes, technologies and tools, and security frameworks. Today, we're going to talk about all three in the in that realm, which is why we brought up cybersecurity and defining it first so that you understand, well, why are we talking about this as we go into zero trust? Zero trust is a subset of a cybersecurity program. Let's define zero trust. So zero trust is a proactive integrated approach to security. It spans all your layers of the digital estate that explicitly and continuously verifies all of your transactions. It asserts a least privileged model. I'm sure we've all heard of JIT. We also rely on intelligence, advanced detection, and real-time response to threats. So what does that actually mean? We're going to kind of unwind that as we go, right? Because it's a, it's a lot of terms and words thrown at you. So let's talk about the zero trust pillars. So first and foremost, we talked about a zero trust approach should extend through the entire digital estate, okay? Um, ideally, it's integrated and using an integrated security philosophy from end to end. So here are the pillars of a zero trust state. So identities, whether they represent people or workloads or endpoints, this defines a zero trust control plane, okay? When an identity attempts to access a resource, we need to verify that the identity is there with strong authentication, so verify it first, ensure access is compliant and typical, right? So that's an important distinction, and typical for that identity, and it follows the least privilege access principle. I'm sure we've all been in environments where that's not the case. If we move on to endpoints, endpoints, once the identity has been granted to a resource, data can flow through a variety of different devices, okay? So, IoT devices, smartphones, maybe it's BYOD, maybe it's partner managed devices, on-premise workloads and clouds, whatever it might be, this massive amount of endpoints creates a, a just a very large attack surface, right? So the diversity of all the different devices creates a massive attack surface area for us. This requires us to monitor and enforce them for health, compliance, and access along the way. So caffeinating. Next, let's move on to applications. So applications and APIs, as an example, provide the interface to which data is consumed. They might be legacy on-premise applications. They might be workloads that have shifted to the cloud or modern SaaS applications altogether. Controls and technologies need to be applied to do things like discover what's in those those areas, ensure the appropriate in-app permissions exist, gate access based on maybe real-time analytics, monitor things for like abnormal behavior, and validate secure configuration options, okay? If we move on down the list, we're at infrastructure. So whether it's again, on-premise, cloud VMs, whatever it might be, this represents a massive threat vector as well. Okay, so using telemetry to detect anomalies or automatically block or flag risky behavior and take some proactive actions is a possibility. Next into network, so all data that is ultimately accessed through network infrastructure. So networking controls can provide those critical in-pipe mechanisms to do things like enhance visibility, 
and help prevent attackers from moving laterally, assuming you have things like network segmentation in place. And data, ultimately, this is what we're focused on protecting, right? So where possible, we want data to remain safe, even if it leaves our applications, our devices, our infrastructure and networks, okay? Which helps us think ways to get there are things like data should be classified, labeled, encrypted, and access is restricted based on those attributes. And so each one of these elements serve as what we're gonna call a signal. And we'll talk more about that, a control plane for enforcement. So let's get into specific zero trust things, okay? So at its basic, basic level, identities and endpoints are filtered through a policy using a variety of tools to grant or deny access based on those signals that we just discussed. I'm gonna get more complex as we go along. So let's take a look at a zero trust architecture. <clears throat> so having an integrated zero trust architecture, so integrated is the key there, creates cohesive policy enforcement and automation using things like threat intelligence and threat protection across all those security pillars. Because you could have separate or disparate tools to do all those things, but when you have those things integrated, they work nicely with one another. And so those integrated elements use things like telemetry across those pillars that we discussed to inform real-time decisions or with based on signals. So in, to in based on those signals that we just discussed, which we're gonna talk more about the signals as we go along, okay? So the foundation is security of, of a zero trust infrastructure is identities. So if we're looking up here, both human and non-human identities need strong authorization. So whether you're connecting from a personal device or corporate endpoints that are compliant devices, requesting access based on strong policies, this evaluation and enforcement, are the rooted that are rooted inside of a zero trust principle, which again are explicit verification, least privilege access, and assumed breach, is the premise of a zero trust architecture. We're going to get more complex yet. So, zero trust policies can use the following signals. It can use the role of the user, the location, device compliance, data sensitivity, application sensitivity, and so much more. So in addition to telemetry and state information, risk assessment also feeds into the policy engine to respond to threats in real time. Again, if you have that integrated uh, set of tools. Uh, policy is enforced at the time of access and is continuously evaluated throughout the session. And finally, if we take a look at the tools that are in place uh, from the Microsoft stack, these are the tools that we're going to be working with and demoing today. Things like Entra Permissions Management, Azure Active Directory, Endpoint Manager, uh, Defender for Cloud, Conditional Access, MFA. So a lot of tools that you've probably heard individually, but putting them together in a configuration that we're going to show today during the demo builds you a zero trust architecture. So what does that look like? Let's talk more about building a zero trust infrastructure with Microsoft tools. So some of the tools that we have, and we're not gonna go too in depth because I don't wanna bore everybody with the slide charts. I really wanna get to the demo because that's where the meat of the presentation is gonna be. But we're just gonna set some basic knowledge pieces of what tools we're gonna use, right? So Entra Azure Active Directory has a couple of them. So conditional access policies, multi-factor authentication, risk detection, conditional access authentication context, and privilege identity manager. We're gonna dive into these individually here in a moment. We're also gonna use Microsoft Endpoint Manager Intune, Defender for Cloud Apps, and Purview Information Protection. So let's take a look at some of these a little more in depth. Still caffeinated. So uh, under the Azure Active Directory, uh, let's talk about conditional access policies. The easiest way to think of a conditional access policy is an if-then statement, okay? If a user wants access to a resource, then the following set of signals must occur for a decision to be made. So user or group targeting, IP location, device-based, even Defender for Cloud app integration exists. 
And then some example decisions would be a grant or a block. And a common common example for MFA would be we're going to require MFA for all users with administrative access, right? And we're going to get a little deeper into that as we go along. <clears throat> so what is MFA? It is a security feature that adds an additional layer of protection to your Microsoft account or Azure AD account. Uh, it requires at least two forms of authentication, and a good example of that would be a password and a security code that's sent to a mobile device. Now, something that's interesting that just came out uh, probably not too long ago that one of our clients informed me of is that numbers matching MFA is coming out to on February 27th to your Microsoft tenants. And if I understood that correctly, they're going to remove the controls to disable it, which will be a user impact to your users using MFA. Um, it's worth looking into. Look up numbers matching MFA on February 27th. Pro tip of the day. Um, so as we keep going down the list, risk detection. So in Azure AD, a risk detection is a feature that helps to identify and mitigate potential threats uh, to your organization using things like machine learning to analyze patterns and to identify anomalies. And we're going to get into risky users and risk detections during the demo today, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. Uh, conditional access authentication context. So it's a set of criteria. Uh, to determine the level of a risk associated with a sign-in request. We're going to talk about this too, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, but it can be used to grant or block specific apps and resources based on the type of network connection, um, the type of device you're using, in addition to your standard conditional access. Uh, PIM. So Azure Active Directory Privileged Identity Manager enables that JIT access, just-in-time access, so the idea would be that everyone is a standard user account and they can elevate their rights on demand inside of a tenant to be able to perform their administrative functionalities. And we'll talk about that today too. So in uh, Endpoint Manager, so mobile device, this one I think most people are probably familiar with, but in case you're not, MDM and MAM, so mobile device management, mobile application management, it can manage compliance uh, policies and profiles, configuration profiles to change settings on the endpoint for the device. And then it also helps you discern personal or corporate owned devices, again, for those signals in that conditional access uh, policy. So Defender for Cloud Apps, this was formerly the Cloud App Security, and this is a CASB that supports um, a variety of different deployment modes, including things like log collection or API connectors and reverse proxy. We're going to talk a lot about this today, too. Uh, but you, it helps you identify uh, cloud apps, IaaS, PaaS services that are used by your organization, whether you know it or not, which is pretty cool stuff. And then it can also detect unusual behavior um, across your estate, your digital estate. So we're going to talk a lot about that today. We're going to show some in our demo. And somebody's calling me. They don't know that I'm presenting. Uh, so then the last one we're going to discuss today, uh, I've got one bullet on it, purview information protection. It does quite a bit, but this is a key pillar to some of our demo today. So it enables you to discover, classify, and protect sensitive information wherever it lives, wherever it travels, and how it's accessed. This is a pretty cool demo that we're going to get to. All right, so like Jason was saying that Zero Trust isn't, it's not just one product, right? There, there's a lot of different tools that you kind of pull together to create these um, controls across your digital estate. So uh, the first one I wanna talk about is identities. And like Jason said, this could represent many things, but today I wanna talk about uh, identities in the context of our our users are our, our people in our organization. <clears throat> so when an identity attempts to access a resource, we want to verify that identity somehow <clears throat> and then take some action to enhance that information about that identity. Like Jason said, location, device information. Is it a time based thing? Do they have a certain risk level? Uh, so the component that I want to show first and, and very simply just a high level uh, conditional access policy is, let me get over here to conditional access. And I want to show this authentication policy. So this one, super high level, 
uh, very uh, nice, simple to give everyone kind of that base level of what I'm talking about. And most most probably already seen this before, but I just wanted to kind of reiterate this at, at this level. So thinking about this as like an if then statement, right? So inside this authentication policy, I want to say if this user, Isaiah, is trying to use Office 365, and here's, I want to bring in one, one little condition here, user risk. So if Isaiah is trying to access Office 365 and the risk level is high, I want to then grant access but require multi-factor authentication. back out of there real quick because now I want to talk about user risk. So here in this report here, I can see risky users and I can see that Isaiah is low. If I want to drill in there just a little bit, I want to see like over here in the risk history. Uh, this user has a low risk, but it's, it's calling out here that it's an unfamiliar sign-in property. So with this user and this tenant, it's new. I logged in from home. I also logged in from the office. We, we've got some, some of those signals that Jason was talking about that's gonna bring in that data, that real-time detection and, and set this as a low risk. Now there could be, you know, if that the, uh, account is compromised, maybe Azure Identity Protection is seeing that on the dark web somehow, it's going to elevate that to a high risk level. And then as we looked at in the conditional access authentication policy, we would then require that user to uh, use MFA so we can you know, validate that they are who they say they are. So Mike, I have a real life example of this at one of our clients that I'll, I'll keep anonymous, but um, we turned on some conditional access policies long after uh, users had been marked risky or not risky. And so one of the things that we fell into was that people were being prompted to change their passwords and some things right out of the gate. And what we didn't account for was their existing status and their risk and their risk user. This is a while ago, but we didn't account for their existing status. So if you're going to be using uh, conditional access policies, that are tied and associated to risky behaviors, risky detections, risky users, go in and validate. And this was from a couple of years ago, the user was marked risky, okay? So this wasn't anything recent, but because of their status or their state, it actually impacted their current user behavior. Now, some of those were probably still valid that they ended up going through and filtering and remediating, but it's just kind of one of those gotchas I want to make sure I shared with the group. Oh, that's great. And you know that now that I'm thinking about it, let me, just pop over to the cloud apps uh, security, the CASB. So uh, we can see here, right in this card here, the top users to investigate. We can uh, drill in on Isaiah. And it's logging me in. There we go. Here I can get more information about those activities or alerts uh, that pertain to that user to see if there's something that we need to take further action on. So this is a, a great way to do that. We can reset that investigation priority score. I can also do some other advanced things here, like we can go ahead and confirm, like if we did any uh, investigation on this, we can confirm that user is uh, compromised, uh, require a user to sign in again, suspend that user, uh, things of that nature. So I, I think that would be uh, interesting. Just just another avenue to look and go and investigate those uh, risky users. Any questions about that? Yeah, so Scott had a great question. So Scott said, uh, once they're a high risk, are they always high risk? And I was actually replying to that too, that until they're remediated or action is taken or something of that nature, there's probably some um, automated actions that we could do. We could take that as an offline, see what we could automate beyond uh, what part of the demo you're going to get to later, right? Because there's some auto remediation we've set up here. 
but we also did lose some context uh, of why they were marked as high in some cases just because they were a couple years old. And Philip also asked, will the slides and recording be made available? Um, absolutely. Steve, you're muted, but I, I, I think you had a good remark on my, my choice of words. <laughs> Uh, back to you, Mike. All right. Um, so one of the other consultants here at Model uh, kind of gave me a quick demo of how they rolled out uh, MFA for an organization. And I thought it was unique and clever. So I wanted to add that in here just to show that. So if an organization were was saying, yes, we want to roll out MFA, uh, maybe the organization is, is resistant to change and we have to slow roll it. Um, I want to show these three. Uh, I think we have time. So uh, this one, it's it's very well named. So you can see that the Azure require MFA for all cloud apps, exclude Azure management, all client apps require MFA sign in frequency every 90 days. Let me pop in here and I'll show you some of that. And we tied this to this group model Azure CA require MFA. So now we can just add users to this group. And then now they're applied to this. So if we wanted to just start slow rolling MFA, we could add them to this group. We are selecting all cloud apps, but we are excluding Azure management because we are taking care of Azure management differently because that's a administrative function. So we have that in a different policy. Uh, the condition here is the client app. So if your browser, mobile app, desktop, or these legacy Exchange Active Sync or other clients, so that is enforced there. And the control here is uh, grant access require MFA, and then the session sign-in frequency is periodic reauthentication every 90 days. out of there so then to kind of build that up a little bit we have the azure ca risk sign-ins all cloud apps sign-in risk level medium and up require mfa so this one is uh, slightly more complicated than that base one that we looked at before and again we have a separate group that's just for risky sign-ins all cloud apps and the condition here is uh, the sign-in risk. So we're introducing a different little component here. So if you are medium or high, it is going to require MFA every time. So before that one was, you know, periodic reauthentication every 90 days. This one, if you're a medium or high, you have to use MFA every time. That's a, a good distinction to make. So if users are calling, complaining about the security being an obstruction to getting things done, going and verifying that they're not medium or high and they're risky uh, and risky users to determine if that's why they're being prompted every time would also do it. And then it, you can also look in the sign-in logs. I think that'll show the conditional access policy in the state of it um, to kind of help troubleshoot that. But that's also a common question we get for clients. But, and then, to kind of round that out, we have this third one here. So risky users, all cloud apps, user risk level. So different from sign-in risk, this is user risk level high, and this is going to force a password change. So looking at this one, we've got this tied to yet another group just called risk users, all cloud apps. The condition here now is going to be user risk like we had in that original one. And if it's high, we are going to force MFA, but every time they log in, mm -hmm. they are going to require the password change. Yeah. Yep. Um, Sorry, let me. I, I I missed that. Require password change. Sorry, this is the yep. check mark I was looking for. And so, uh, really, a point I need to make on that, Mike, and I'll stop interrupting as we go. But no worries, uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, self server password reset needs to be configured before you do any of this, right? Otherwise, they're going to require password change. They're going to be dead in the water. Yep. So, each one of those 
individual Azure CA require risk, risky users, each one of those is tied to an individual AD, Azure AD group. But what we did, up over here to groups. is we have this uh, one group model Azure CA identity protection measures. And members. So then nested in that group are those three require MFA risk sign ins and risky users. So to start slow rolling this, if you wanted to go ahead and implement MFA, risky sign in and risky users, you would then just have one group to start, you know, slow rolling those users into that one group, and then they would be uh, therefore assigned to those conditional access policies. So I want to address a controversial topic that I'm making controversial for the point of the, the, the demo. Is, Is it that we actually, groups? You betcha. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we've done this before. Um, so nesting groups at model, we actually don't believe in nesting groups except for one layer deep. And so this follows right in line with our um, goal of not going more than one layer deep inside of nested groups, because otherwise it becomes an onion that you can't peel back the layers on and determine what the heck's actually going on. So one layer deep, and this is for on-prem as well, uh, is generally our, our guidance on nested, there's, there's the camera, our guidance on nesting groups. So falls within our, um, our guidelines of nesting groups and making sure that it's easy to unwind if need be. And... In our next uh, Microsoft series next month, we have, I think we focus just on identities. And we have a, a special little addition to that, uh, a little teaser for how we can handle some uh, dynamic group automation. Oh, now I'm excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. All right, so with that, I just wanted to take a quick pause we did just a quick high level overview of just some conditional access policies. I, I think I think I got through everything. Yep. Is there any questions, anything I missed before I change gears? Nothing in chat. All right. Move it on. All right. Next, I want to talk about the privilege and identity management. So Oh, so this is uh, kind of that just-in-time access, right? So if we're using uh, these uh, AD roles like global administrator, right? We don't want just uh, your user account in global administrator or any of these other privileged roles just sitting there all the time. In case something like your account gets compromised somehow, they're able to access that, you're just not sitting inside one of those high-privileged roles where they could really, you know, move laterally across your um, your cloud. So with uh, privilege identity management, I want to look at roles. <clears throat> so global administrator, this really just has access to all administrative features. So we definitely do not want users sitting in there. Now, here's a good example, right? So active assignments in here, we do have some people setting in here. So what we did for the demo portion is we pulled Isaiah out and provided him access to elevate to a global administrator role. So he's not just sitting in that role. So let me show a quick demo of that just in case. So while you're bringing that up, um, our recommendation is obviously very minimal people, very few people should have global administrator, but we chose this role because it has the most impact and we want to limit who can actually have it. So it's a demo scenario, right? So I don't think we really have that many people in a global administrator role in a real organization. Um, we try to limit that down as much as possible, so. Yeah, and this is just to show how that elevation works. And then I'll step back over and show some, uh, just a couple of other features in there that I wanted to make sure that we show. All right, so I can see here eligible assignments. I can be an application developer, a global admin. I need to do some administrative work. So I need to uh, PIM. And I, sorry, I gotta, gotta do some MFA here. It's like security is working. Group. 
Okay, so now I can come in here. So I can set this uh, eight hours or less if I don't need that long, but uh, need GA or admin work. So in this one, I do have to give a reason to activate that and it'll start to move through these stages. And there's different things that we can assign in these different stages. Maybe like if it's an MFA role and someone uh, needs to elevate for that, there could be an approval process where some people have to go in and stamp an approval button that says, yes, you can have that. And Mike Scott wants to know if this can be, if this can go all the way down to the workstation admins, and if so, if Intune is required to do that. To be able to elevate and PIM to the Azure AD role, or you're talking about workstation admins like on the local group of the device? Um, somebody wanting to administer the device. So instead of creating <clears throat> separate accounts, one for the day-to-day -day work, mm -hmm. and then a separate one for administrative work, mm -hmm. can we delegate it? in that way um, similar to how you're you're getting um, access to the global admin role if they need to do administrative work on their workstation so mike that new feature of pimming to a group being able to add yourself to a group let's say we nest that group in all of the device workstations right so we call it admins group for the workstations can you use pim to add yourself to a group for a period of time and then it removes you from the group on the daily, so they would have to PIM to get workstation admins. Is that Would that be a usable case scenario? So we need, let me back up here. So uh, there is this new feature, uh, it's in preview right now, it's this group. Uh, so the demonstration I just showed was we PIM into a single role. So uh, Isaiah, needed to do global admin work, so he uh, used PIM to just select that one role. The new group preview here is we can have a group that is assigned multiple roles. So instead of PIMing to a role, we're gonna PIM to a group that has multiple roles. Uh, for the question though is, and I, I don't know this offhand, and Dan, you might, I need your help here for the local admin access so, for workstations. So, Mike, here's my thought. If the group, let's just, has nothing to do with Azure AD roles. If the mm -hmm. group is called workstation admins, and then on your workstation, you go into the administrators group and workstation admins is a group in there, can you just PIM to the group? Has nothing to do with Azure AD roles, rather. There's device administrators or something of that nature that exists in there. Um, but generally, can you just add yourself dynamically to a group for a period of time using the PIM infrastructure? Isn't that what the group's PIM does? Uh, so go PIM to a group. Sorry. Pull that up here. <laughs> so here's the group. Yep. So nobody's in it now. And if you go PIM to it, do you, does your account go into it? Up over here. So here I'm back in the uh, uh, desktop for Isaiah. Yep. I go to groups and I am eligible for the help desk role. So if I activate that. Yep. So I think you're seeing role. innovation at its finest on the fly. <laughs> yeah. And can you um, put a cap on how long they could do it? Like give them, give them an hour. You yes. Mentioned. Okay. Oh, yeah. But you'd have to either run some form of NL test or some way to refresh the the token. I, I would assume to get the credentials on the local device, have them reboot would be the easiest way um, to get that account to actually be an active admin because you're nesting a group inside of Azure AD or mm -hmm. that would need to get down to the workstation. So there might be a timing issue or a challenge or a process around it, but I think it'll work. Okay, so now Isaiah is an active assignment to the help desk role. And if I look at Azure AD roles, my active assignments, I should have four now. So global admin, and then inside that help desk role, that kind of demo one was 
we assign Intune admin, Exchange admin, and user admin. What I might want to do is take offline and see if that group, if I can just add a non eight non AD role to it, well, which see, that's would, the thing. would it's be not the your workstation. It would just you know be, you know what I mean. It would just be taking that group and putting it in local admins on a workstation. So now, if you refresh that and you have a member in there, yeah. So I I think Scott, the, the biggest challenge you're gonna have is the timing and the order of precedence. But I think that it's yeah. a possibility. It might be easier to, to keep with using the two separate IDs um, as well, because then that ensures that there's that um, signal you're in a different context because uh -huh. um, that's can be a challenge where, you know, when you drop somebody into administrators um, and leave them there, that means they're surfing the internet and clicking on email <laughs> attachments as admin, which is never a good that's idea. True. So, yeah, but it was, it, 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 yeah, but thanks. Thanks for humoring me. <laughs> <laughs> no and this, this is Dan. The, the other thing I'd like to call out around this is we did just come out with the Intune advanced management suite which includes the ability to add Intune remote help and Intune privilege management, which is the ability to actually allow your users to request that escalation. And then through the Intune portal, approve that as a help desk or uh, administrator in the Intune portal. Okay, cool. No, that's great. And Dan, you called that the Intune advanced management? Yeah, it's part of the Intune Advanced Management Suite, and I'll I'll drop a link in the up. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's already there, so uh, yeah, that's new from from us. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Jason, did I miss anything on PIM? I know we kind of took a, a yeah. No, it's fun. Almost. It's the beauty of a live presentation, man. Um, <laughs> No, I, I think we got it covered. I mean, there's a lot more you can do with approvals and timing and only allow them to PIM at certain times so you can put schedules on it. So there's some pretty dynamic controls you can do with it. Um, but for the demo that we're trying to show, just the least privilege access model of the zero trust architecture, that's that's it. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to now, I'm gonna go back to conditional access. OK, so this one took me a while to wrap my head around, so I'm going to try to step through this best I can. And Jason, please help me out on this one. So you bet. I want to set up this scenario. And in this scenario, I want to be able to have uh, like a SharePoint site that is, you know, has highly privileged, sensitive data on there. And I want to be able to block uh, you know, BYOD devices or non-compliant or non-managed devices, so they, they can't even get to it. And if they're on a managed device, it's it's good, right? Uh, the second one is I want to be able to monitor all the, the SharePoint activity through the cloud, app, cloud access security broker. And then on another SharePoint site, I want to be able to have additional controls to say if you want to print if you want to copy data off of a document we're going to uh, enforce a, um, an, a an additional mfa or something of that sorts yeah let's just make sure steve we got plenty of time yes how many how much time you're muted yeah we have plenty of time okay cool Perfect. so yeah mike let's dive into it man Okay, so the Plus first thing recording. I want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the first thing I want to do is uh, go over here. So under conditional access, there's this thing called the authentication context. So uh, the way I kind of think about this is yeah, what they said. We want to be able to tag a resource and then leverage that tag with inside a conditional access policy to to do something so under authentication metadata. exactly yeah so i've got one here just called additional authentication so think of it of just like kind of like a tag that says i want i want to do something whenever this is invoked so let me back up here 
conditional access. So the first one is uh, CASB auth context MFA. And let me jump in there. So this is going to be for all users. I'm going to call that authentication context, the, the one that we named that tag additional authentication. And then I'm going to require MFA. So whenever that tag is called inside of like a, a SharePoint site, it's going to require MFA. And Jason, jump in if I'm saying this wrong. Nope, so far so good. The next one I want to do is have this custom access control. But this time, I only want specific users. So anybody that's going to be in this group that are trying to get on Teams, SharePoint, Yammer, we're going to use a conditional access app control policy. We're going to use a custom policy, and I'm going to jump over there and tie this together in just a minute. And then the app enforce policy, this is where we're going to say that, you know, specific users, anybody in this group, and they're trying to go to SharePoint. And the condition here is going to be whether a browser, mobile app, desktop, legacy, we're going to use an app enforced restriction, and I'll show you how we tie that in here because we got to jump over to a different tool to do those. So just to recap, we've got the authentication context tag. We're going to use that tag to uh, enforce MFA. We're going to use a custom policy over in the cloud app portal. And on SharePoint, we're going to leverage this with a information rights management policy to either allow managed access for a device that's managed or blocking like a like a BYOD device. Yeah, so to help clarify, what we're trying to do is set up scenarios where a user from one device that's managed can do things. That same user from an unmanaged device, we'll call it a home PC, we want them to get to be able to see things, but we can't have them do certain things with the data. So in our zero trust framework, we're really trying to limit and split hairs on what device are in, use those signals very specifically for the same user. And it's going to feel like the same user, but depending on where they are and what device they're using, it's going to be a vastly different experience. Yep. All right. So go back over my cloud apps, control, and policies. So remember back here, we're going to use that custom access control policy in here. So we have one here called step up off confidential. That's correct. So Zach had, Zachary had a great question. And we'll show some of that here momentarily. OK. So policy, we are selecting a category of access control, and we're going to block activities. So then activities matching all of the following. So if they're trying to print, paste, cut, or copy, and the app equals anything in Office 365, and the user is in that group, we are going to then move down here to require that step up authentication. And here is where we add that tag, that auth authentication context tag. So real quick, that's going to then go back and enforce that conditional access policy where that tag sits. This policy doesn't do anything until that tag is invoked. Yes. I know I'm bouncing around a lot, but hopefully, hopefully everyone's following and I'm not just. There's not get, get, right. <laughs> so now we have this policy. That is going to prevent, you know, or it's going to. Do that step up authentication. So let me cancel out of here and then. In purview. I want to come down to the information protection. 
And here is a PowerShell what... script that ties all these actions together. That sounds like a William Bracken question. <laughs> the answer is, I don't know, but you just sent me on a journey. <laughs> <laughs> there will be by lunch. Yeah, we'll have a we'll have it written soon. Very good. So purview, information protection, labels. So here we wanted to create, um, it, like in that scenario, we have sales data. It's super important. We only want like very trusted devices to be able to see or manipulate any of that data. So inside of Highly conf Confidential, we created a subcategory that says, this is just for device compliance. And basically it's saying that uh, once applied to a SharePoint site, the label will prevent non-compliant devices from accessing content. Uh, second step is you have to have a label policy. We called ours unmanaged. So if you're an unmanaged device, you're not gonna get access. And how we apply that, SharePoint active sites and we had US sales. So the sales data we have defined as an organization that it's highly sensitive. We do not want this to get out and the policies we set the sensitivity to that highly confidential device compliance label that we defined over in purview. Let me see. So I think I've got everything kind of explained and tied together. So let me. So now I'm going to go uh, from this managed desktop. Corporate desktop managed Corporate. by the Contoso uh, Electronics Company. Okay, so with those policies that we set up that said it's going to uh, leverage the cloud app security broker to kind of sit in front, you can see that it's kind of changed that uh, URL up here. It says, hey, your SharePoint's monitored, right? So we're giving that information to the end user saying that, hey, we've got some capabilities here. We're trying to secure this information. You know, you can hide it or just continue. Okay, so within US sales, this is the one that we selected as highly confidential. Documents, sales west. Okay, so here we just got some, some documents here. So here's our Northwind proposal contract. Has Northwind been around since NT4? That's like old. Is that longer than Tailwind Toys or? <laughs> Maybe. Okay, so here, uh, corporate device, we can access that content. All good. That's correct, Philip. So let me. So I had to run home real quick and get on my home device, and I was going to finish that document. Was it the snow that made you have to go home? Yep. Yep. All right. All right. So I'm just closing that out. That's that's the managed one. So yeah, here's unmanaged. Office. So the key takeaway is on the managed device, right? No problem getting the sales. Cheat here one second, get that. Username because I can't remember it off the top of my head. Yeah, future, I think we're going to have to buy a vanity domain and configure the environment. Sure. All right, so back in the same spot, 
unmanaged home device, and I need to go to SharePoint. And once again, it's going to alert the users that they are being monitored or the SharePoint data is being monitored. And I can get to SharePoint. I'm on a home PC, but I want to go to US Sales. Can't do it. So here's that policy in action going from a corporate managed device to a uh, BYOD device with the label uh, protecting the US Sales SharePoint site. If you're from a corporate device, it's good. If you're from a unmanaged device, it's it's denied access. So Mike, I'm going to add a bit of flavor in here because I can't help myself. Um, in the cybersecurity program, one of the first steps we talked about was defining those business processes and identifying your critical data. And so identifying what SharePoint sites or what data is critical, which ones are accessible from home, that is not a tech, tech responsibility. That is a business decision. And so having those business decisions made and enforced through technology is part of the cybersecurity program. And so these are the tools and how to do that. Is there a way for a user to request to override this policy based on necessity? <clears throat> Let me think about that. That's a good question. So. I think you'd have to get on a managed device. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I agree. I, in in this scenario here, it would have to be from a managed device. Yeah, you could yeah. open a contact your support support team support desk. You could yeah. uh, host a what is it, Dan Windows three sixty five box and have them connect temporarily and on demand. Yeah, you could definitely use a Windows 365 cloud PC, but it may not be that temporary uh, mm. access that you would want. You'd want that to be your 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 corporate PC. Yeah. yeah, I see. So there's probably some kind of creative solution we could get to, but I think at, at least in this perspective, it relies on the um, the device the way we have it set up. Yeah, and this was the sales data was you know designated by the organization of highly confidential so this was <clears throat> this wasn't something that IT would just go decide on the sales site we're going to lock this down so only corporate managed devices can get to so for instance if i go back to sharepoint yes i monitored And I want to go to the Mark 8 project team. So this one is not designated as highly confidential. I can get into the documents here. And maybe I want to look at the design. And I want to open up this document here. And that's a good point. It shouldn't be a surprise to a user that if they try and access that information from home that they can't get to it. They should have already been communicated that that's a policy. Yeah, great point, Steve. And so while I'm in here, I want to go back and show that uh, where we created that authentication context policy about copying and printing. So uh, I'm on the unmanaged device. I can come in here and I can say, oh, I really like this data. I want to <laughs> want to copy that. I really like this data. It's nice yeah. data. <laughs> <laughs> nice data. That's some good so, data. <laughs> so it says, hey, um, something's fishy here. We want to, we got to do some more work here. So now it's going back, calling that authentication context, which is part of that conditional access policy that says hey, you got to get a multi-factor again. And yep. I get so in this case, you're allowed to the site or even allowed to the data. You've been allowed to copy and paste the data. However, we want to make sure you are who you say you are. That's that zero trust framework, always validating, verifying and asserting least privileged model at the time of the interaction. Yep. So now I should be able to. 
This is where if we we're in person, everybody would be hooting and hollering and clapping and saying how awesome it is and that kind of thing. Hooting and hollering, you say? Yeah, I'm from Illinois, okay? Okay. Not that that's bad. <laughs> uh, and you know, if if we're curious here, so if I switch back over to the managed desktop, that same policy will follow. So going back to SharePoint, yes, I'm monitored. Maybe a um, Zach, you had a question. Yeah, so you, you have a policy on the U.S. sales SharePoint. Can you can the can the policy be scripted to only, I guess, prohibit like sensitive data, like data that's been tagged as sensitive or scanned as as, as sensitive from being downloaded, as opposed to an entire SharePoint site? Like, is so that on this just one, the logic of creation? I guess. Now, this one is just at the site level. So this policy, and that's part of the information protection. So let me get back over here. So think about information protection as one component of like DLP, right? So you could have a data loss prevention. Did I lose everybody? Nope, you're good. No, okay, sorry. I thought I heard something. So DLP would operate slightly different where we could start to tag that individual uh, piece of data and have policies around how that type of data is or is allowed to be manipulated. Sure. Dan, okay. it, am I saying that right? Yes, I believe so, but I had some kids running around in the background, so I, I may have missed that. <laughs> yeah, you can no protect the you can protect the data at the individual data level or at the site uh, container level. Yeah, so if if it was me and there were just pieces of data that's been tagged, I would use a DLP policy uh, over this one, which is more, uh, more of an umbrella over that entire site. Got it. And what was I doing here? So managed. Uh, I was just going to okay. show that we, you know yeah. you get the same behavior. Yeah. So whether you're managed or unmanaged, that tag of additional authentication is still going to apply, right? So, and that's for the purposes of the demo. And depending on the device, not sure you'd want that to apply to the device or not. So you'd maybe define define the policy a little differently. Because um, inside of the CASB, you can add different layers and policy tags and all sorts of stuff to get it to do what you want. But to make it an exciting demo, uh, this is probably an easier way to see it. And uh, demo fail on my part here. I was already logged in, so my token is still valid. And that's why it didn't prompt me here. Maybe a dumb question, but uh, I know with uh, several of our clients for operating system uh, updates and patching, uh, a lot of our clients like to use branded messages so their end users know that it's official. Is there any way to customize those security messages or are they canned and um, they are what they are? There, there are some customizations that you can do. I don't know offhand, and I'll have to look this up, if, it, if a logo can be added to that. But I know that on some of those, you can customize the text. Okay, yep. cool. But I can I can look up for as a takeaway. I like that the internal model people are giving to do's for this meeting because it's usually me that's doing. It. I'm like, hey, Mike, can you do this? You're like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, sorry. <laughs> and Jason, I'm sorry. I. I don't know if that made sense to everybody, but I went back under the managed desktop and I already had a valid token and that's why it didn't prompt me again for that MFA. Yeah, so we played with that a lot yesterday to get this to happen over repeated times. And what we noticed is that it had to do with cookie settings and then the yeah, timing because we were going boom, 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 boom. So there was no time. Uh, part of it's probably the demo setup, but realistically, 
Um, we'd probably want to do some kind of browser configuration on managed desktops to ensure that it happens every time. But you just close the browser. So when you go back into that document and try to copy I, it, I think it should. It should, it should do it, it should. now. Yeah. Um, I held Mike hostage on the phone yesterday until we understood all aspects for this demo. Demo in real life sometimes are a little different. And I think you were using the Word doc yesterday when you were doing the instead of the PDF, because we're trying to copy, right? <clears throat> oh, that's right. My yeah. bad. It's all good. It, it but now it should, it should absolutely prompt you. I like this text. I want to copy it. Anytime you use the word absolutely in a demo, you're always setting yourself up for an interesting demo. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure we did get that. Yeah. Otherwise, it would, it would bug me. <laughs> totally get it. And so I think the big takeaway is designing what you want to have happen on managed, unmanaged devices based on account, network, signal, whatever signals you want to use. There's a variety of ways to do it with within just, let's say, conditional access itself, but then expanding it to purview and information protection, expanding it to um, defender for cloud apps is a an absolute necessity when you want to get to some of those more granular permissions. Yeah, and I just want to pause there before I shift gears into the last step. Uh, I know we went through that kind of quick where we talked about those conditional access, the authentication context, and how we then utilize those different conditional access policies to affect like the information protection and cloud app security broker policy and applying those labels to SharePoint sites and then demoing that from an unmanaged or a managed uh, uh, desktop does requiring two-factor authentication uh, will it work with duo so That's a great a third question. party third party mfa provider is that what you're asking um mm -hmm. the same controls correct that is a an excellent question um that's probably a takeaway or a to do. Um, a lot of times what we see is consolidation of tools, because if you remember in that zero trust presentation that I started on, having an integrated landscape of tools, and I get some people have already paid for whatever they paid for, um, generally that integrated landscape of tools gives you a lot more cohesive capabilities for threat protection, detection, all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, Steve, I don't know if you're keeping a list of to-dos or Mr. Bracken, if you're keeping a list of to-dos, but I would say we should look to see what capabilities are possible with, with third-party two-factors. Before you start the next one, um, give uh, Jake, did you have a question? Yeah, um, in regards to the copy-paste MFA policy, is there a way to block screenshots as well for data protection? Um, so there, there is in certain devices with uh, MAM containerization um, and MDM, depending on the provider, some of that is native to having the device managed. In regards to cloud app security, uh, Mike, flip over to cloud app security, we'll do it live. Because why not? So if you go to your policy where you had your um, tag set up for additional authentication, um, let's just hit that drop down and see what options are available. I can't recall because devices handle it differently in the mobile world, right? So Android uh, and iPhone are, are different in how they handle this. One has to be managed, one doesn't. Uh, so if you do, drop that down activity type. So see that to the right? Nope. Down to your labels, down. Oh, here? Yeah, okay, we can just to... add another one. Sure. Activity type. Yeah, man. So you've got location user, user agent string, so activity type, we mm -hmm. can say uh, is set. Uh, maybe I can't do Yeah, that. so um, you, I don't think you can add that's multiple what, activity. To, okay. You do, just drop down the print, paste, cut item, yeah. So those are the actions available um, inside of CASB. So you would have to use containerization at the device level on a mobile device or on Windows, um, but it would have to come through Intune because those are capabilities that are um, likely Managed or unmanaged is going to depend on the carrier. And if you wanted to, you know, outside of the demo, if you wanted to work through some of those, I would be more than happy to 
get on another call with you and, and work through some of those scenarios. Yeah, and um, William, it, it just confirm it. William, are you taking to do's or should I be writing down the to do's just out of curiosity? I've, I've got a list here. OK, Mike's got them. cool. Yeah, full disclosure, I'm working on Power BI at the same time and kind of listening. So. Oh. Yeah, just for everyone's edification, William is the other co-founder of Model Technology Solutions and our CTO. And I, the only thing I missed that the last uh, participant's name for the uh, Jake Defender Whistler. For Cloud. Jake, Jake Whistler. Perfect. Yeah, good question. Any okay. Others? So on to the, what is it, the last piece of the demo, Mike? Are we getting close? It to is. Yeah. This is the last one. So uh, this one will be a little bit uh, shorter than the last one, but this one is all around Intune. And what I wanted to do is talk about how Intune, where you can select policies or configuration, like Jason was saying, there's compliance, there's configuration policies. And I just want to show one quick one real quick. And, and just kind of talk about that. So let me hop on over here to configuration profiles. And I've got a kind of zero trust policy here. Now on this one, I've got this one uh, set down to just um, users in this group, right? So we can set these policies to only affect certain users or certain devices or certain groups of users. But in this one, I just wanted to just kind of, and this one is super high level, but it was important. So within Defender, I want to block persistence through a WMI event subscription on a block JavaScript or VB script from launching downloadable executable content or block the execution of potentially obfuscated scripts and allow uh, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint to scan those scripts, right? So very, it's a very targeted approach to um, locking down a, a certain attack vector. And what do I mean by that? So with the block JavaScript or VB script from launching download, downloaded executable content, <clears throat> If, if everyone's kind of familiar with what they call like the drive-by compromise, right? So a adversary would host a website, right? And users would visit that website. Well, while the browser is a uh, visiting that website, those uh, scripts that run from that website in the background, there, there are ways that those scripts can then scan the user's machine, look for potential um, browser plugins that may have vulnerabilities or in certain cases be able to scan the system for certain vulnerabilities or have a script download that is then going to go back to a different uh, site website url a sub container on that website that has some kind of executable content that could then uh, plant some kind of other remote access type of, of code or execution that would, uh, you know, call back out to a uh, um, adversary's, uh, you know, machine. So that one is important. And, and each one of these are going to have those type of attack vectors, uh, you know, kind of wrapped around those. So I wanted to point this one out because this one is important, but there's like, a hundred other important ones to do. <laughs> and by using Intune, you can really start to get a granular approach to which device or which group of users have which controls or which configuration. It's very, very powerful. Yeah, so I want to add a little bit of that. So security hygiene, <clears throat> when we talk about zero trust architecture, humans trying to access data is one thing. But devices passively being drive-by attacked, as Mike was saying, is a whole nother thing. So we have to think in terms of not just a human trying to access data, but somebody trying to plant something on our device on a regular basis. So uh, this is just an example of taking a look at the other side of the 
the configuration, which is we need to also put in security measures on the device, whether a human's trying to access data or not. We need to disallow that trust. And so this is a way of doing so now. There are um, certainly cases to be made that you can lock a device down to where it's no longer productive for a user and overlocking it down. So this all has to be designed and tested and in your environment based on what your people are doing, what they're allowed to do, and there's so many other controls to it, network segmentation, et cetera. But nonetheless, we wanted to show that Endpoint Manager Intune is a part of the solution in the Microsoft framework. The earlier point, this all seems to work great when using Microsoft products, but can this work with non-Microsoft cloud or on-prem apps? So in short, it uh, depends, uh, the best consulting answer on the planet. Uh, but here's a great example. So VPN using Azure MFA absolutely works. We've set that up. We have it established here. So you can do third-party integration in instances and scenarios. Again, if you go back, to the beginning of the slide that this the premise of this conversation was talking about using microsoft tools in a zero trust architecture i understand that other people are going to have other tools but you really unlock the power of a threat detection a threat alerting automation behind it a full landscape when you're using a comprehensive set of integrated tools um, i don't work for microsoft but i do believe in the stack behind it so it's going to depend on what tools you want to use and in what scenarios and what the capabilities are that's the longest way to answer of it of it depends <laughs> now we keep hearing from our customers that their main goals are to cut costs and eliminate redundant solutions to get best of breed protection and productivity and to deliver simple to use solutions designed to work together. So basically a path for um, lean, secure and uh, up to date infrastructure, one that frees up resources for improving your, com your company and community. We have a new 2023 solution offering called MMM365 plus CS, and I'd like to give you a brief overview and get your feedback. And then that'll be all we have to, to cover today. Um, Microsoft M365 is complex, has a lot of functionality, and is license and the licensing is ever changing. It includes Azure, Intune, Defender, Sentinel, Active Directory, Windows, and a whole lot more. And the question is, what percentage of your M365 spend are you using effectively? Basically, Model can help with anything outside of Dynamics and Power Platform. Model would appreciate the opportunity to help you and your friends design, implement, <laughs> deploy, maintain, and automate any M365 functionality that you don't have the time or experience to. So our service and experience cover Azure, M365, as well as VCSO tools and services and support desk services. And we're an indirect micro, Microsoft Cloud Services provider for licensing management. So that's a, another recap of our overview of services. And the go-to-market offering I'd like your feedback on is the M365 plus CS. Uh, the benefits are you get more return out of your M365 investment. You can discover unused functionality and replace unnecessary apps which in the current economy, everybody is interested in why do I have multiple tools doing the same thing? We enable security, automation, productivity, and ease of use, whether your environment is simpler, simple or complex. We can use proven best practices that we've gleaned from other clients to enable and satisfy your end users, help you get ahead of your endless IT tasks and refocus on building a stronger company and community. And like Jason said in the beginning, that um, uh, making the world a better place is really part of Model's uh, uh, core DNA. And you don't need a particular service, don't pay for it. All of the core services can be purchased together with a discount or individually to fill your gaps. So um, with that, please complete the survey that I put in the chat um, that will give us feedback on this event as well as uh, future sessions so we can improve them. If you haven't already registered, please do. Next, we're seeking uh, the feedback on the offering. So I've put a list of quick start workshops in the evaluation listed, and I would love for you to list them by interest. The top being the most interesting and the bottom being least interested, that'll help us uh, with uh, which ones we promote. 
And finally, if you'd like to give our M365 services a try, you can select one of the no-cost uh, starter workshops for us to execute together at no cost. And we'll also make a $50 donation to the charity of your choice in an effort to build better companies and communities. So with that, um, are there any further questions or input or suggestions? If not, we will hope to see you at the end of next month, or um, yeah, if there's a workshop of interest, I'll follow up with you and we'll get it scheduled. Hope you all have a great rest of the week. Mm -hmm.